in an African village, everybody's turned out for the celebration. There's an Englishman on hand, too, the district officer, and he has an important message to deliver. But he'll wait until the festivities are over. to deliver the speech, and the interpreter is summoned. He's probably going to talk about building that new road, although it might be any one of a dozen projects. And this might be any one of many British colonies in remote parts of the world. This district officer was the embodiment of imperial authority. That authority has sometimes been called paternalistic, and that's our topic in this program. In our last program, we saw how highly debatable the whole subject of colonialism has become. We'll be pursuing that debate through the next few programs. Starting now with one aspect of it, paternalism, the business of the great white father telling the natives what to do for their own good. But who were these natives? What were they like in these far-flung colonies? The Union Jack had often been heisted over lands with ancient societies of their own, as in parts of West Africa. Many of these lands were teeming with people, unlike colonial Canada and Australia, and the people were not necessarily barbarians. But Britain also acquired other possessions, like New Guinea in the Pacific, where the people were still living in the Neolithic stage. And today in Malaya, there are tribes which have not progressed much further. But all these people, no matter how simple, had their own way of doing things of getting their food and cooking it, and making tools and clothes and weapons. Some were developing crafts that were quite complex, but the evolution was very slow. in East Africa or West, the Seychelles or the Solomons, North Borneo or Fiji, these people had cultures of one sort or another, but often there were severe limitations. Primitive tools scratching at the parched earth could make agriculture back-breaking and unrewarding. For simple people, the soil often withheld its bounty and allowed hunger to flourish. And there were other horrors, like the locust. This was the tragedy, that there's skill enough even to begin to control the hostility of nature. was always there, and the desperate effort of work and survival could sometimes turn into a dance.
nature was being invoked. And because nature was unkind and frightening, the rich could be frightening. This was the dark side of primitive religion. spoke of these people as half devil and half child. And in the 19th century, many Britons felt it was their duty to bring British law to them. Of course, this may now seem to have been very arrogant and high-handed. And cynics may say that the real reason imperialists established law and order was to make it safe for themselves to take everything in sight and ship it back to the mother country. We'll be going into that later. Let's first consider some of the things that were going on in these remote places when the British arrived. And let's try to understand what the natural British reaction might have been. For there were many grim things to be seen. There was cannibalism in some places, and kings and priests who conducted human sacrifices, for life could be very cheap. Africa, there were endless tribal wars, full of brutality that didn't spare women and children. Wherever the British came, they separated the warring tribes, arranged treaties, brought peace, and started to govern. And the British officer, full of self-assurance, never seemed to doubt his mission his right to rule other people's countries. It was indirectly through the chiefs that the British often governed. Though they had sometimes conquered through force, they tried to rule through persuasion to try to help the uncivilized. For this was an age with little self-criticism and few Europeans doubted the marvelous wisdom of the European way of life. Although there were a few Africans, a few old-timers, who didn't want any part of it. The British allowed tribal councils and tribal courts to continue, but they brought their own institutions to operate alongside. And in a British-style court, justice was not quite as arbitrary as it might be in a native one. from another British official some advice. Taxes have been collected locally, and the money is in neat little bags. Now the chiefs are meeting to decide how it will be spent. Everybody agrees that two bags full should go for road repairs, so that's budgeted. But what about repairs to the school? There are some disagreements here, but one thing is certain, the people will be getting something for their tax money. In many cases, before the British came, the chiefs raised taxes by force and spent them as they pleased on themselves. So local finance is another area where the British have brought improvements. For British colonial officials, it was and is a duty to make frequent visits to the most remote parts of their territories to see how the people are faring and to give advice where needed. The officials often had a genuine interest in the culture of the tribesmen, and the white man's interest did much to win the people's trust and cooperation.
stereotype picture that many people have about colonial officials. High-handed, bureaucratic, indifferent. Needs a lot of revising in the light of the British record. For well over half a century now, the British Colonial Service, known since 1954 as Her Majesty's Overseas Civil Service, has produced a remarkable group of men. Paternalism may soon be outdated, but it has had its devoted servants too. Men who were genuinely concerned about the glaring needs and difficulties of the colonial subjects. The ancient traditional ways of doing things are not always good ways, for they can consume a tremendous amount of human energy and still produce indifferent results. If only these people could be taught to use a plow, to make an animal do the work. The chief ought to try this plow, says the man from the colonial office. It's really a better way. And so the chief does try it. a bit of practice, but isn't it much better than bending over and doing it with your hands? If the chief agrees, everybody in the village will agree. The tribe will take up plowing, making life much easier for themselves. But in many cases, better work methods aren't enough. The land itself must be enriched. But often the biggest problem of all is water. For in some colonies, water is very scarce. And well digging is essential, difficult, and dreary. It has to be done. For without water, nothing can grow and the cattle will die. In Africa, despite many rivers, drought affects many areas. easier, better ways to get water, but many people have never heard of irrigation. So it sometimes has to be explained to them and their suspicions overcome. This was the Sudan, once partly governed by British and now independent. A great dam built by the British brought water from the Nile to the hot, dry plains, making it possible to grow more and bigger crops. So that the farmers could understand how it would work and how it would affect them, they were shown a scale model of the massive project. Other irrigation projects were started in various parts of the empire. And the simple fact of water running through the thirsty earth could mean new hope for poor people. With proper farming methods, as taught by the colonial administrators, the indignity of hunger has become far less familiar.
tsetse fly, only a bit bigger than the common house fly. But this sucks blood and carries microscopic agents of sleeping sickness, of disease and death for both man and beast. This was West Africa some years ago. There was a great assembly of tribesmen and cattle in the almost barren Northern Territories, where the tsetse fly and rinderpest made a hard life harder. The British had sent out some men who said they knew how to deal with these diseases, but the chief had to be persuaded. The chief was wise and he agreed the tribe's cattle were inoculated. Now there would not be so much disease, not for the animals. This was one of the great things Britain brought to her colonies, clever ways to kill the things that creep and crawl and burrow and bite and make people and animals sick. Holding country fairs and exhibitions is one of several ways the British have devised to show Africans and other colonial peoples how to better themselves. By building improved houses, for instance, as shown by an ingenious model. Or by having a model farmyard and making cleanliness a part of farming routine. For by teaching such a simple matter as washing hands, where it was not the practice before, the colonial authorities have put an end to much needless disease and human waste. Life in many colonial areas has certainly been improved. Once famine and disease were constant threats, and the tribes could sometimes increase their own misery by fighting not nature, but each other. But when the British came, all this started to change. It's the individual small farmer, like that one, who may well be the key to the future of the underdeveloped parts of the world. We hear a great deal about industrialization of these places, but food is the first essential need. And teaching these people how to produce enough of it is probably a more fundamental achievement than building a steel mill for them. But the steel mill is spectacular, and it gets a lot of publicity. Teaching agriculture, as the British Colonial Office has long been doing, is tedious, unspectacular work, and you don't hear about it a great deal. And the same is true of health services, a tremendous need. In Africa, for instance, when the British arrived, they found that the people had to face some terrifying diseases. And as a physician, the witch doctor left much to be desired. There were a good many tropical diseases that magic could not cure. Yet the white man had ways to deal with these diseases, even though they were almost unknown in his own country. Diseases like yaws, leprosy, malaria, yellow fever, smallpox. To the villages, the colonial officials brought preventive measures. And in larger centers, they established clinics where people could bring their aches and pains and worries 
just as they do in more advanced parts of the world. First, suspicion and prejudice greeted European medicine. But when its results became obvious, there was a great demand for treatment. And besides alleviating distress, the colonial authorities helped forestall it with courses for mothers and those about to become mothers, for healthy children are the basis of healthy nations. In Britain, there are students from all over the colonies learning medicine. For in the lands they come from, the demand for trained doctors far exceeds the supply. And the African doctor who understands his own people is especially valuable. He and others like him are increasingly in evidence in Africa's consulting rooms and operating theaters. Someday, perhaps not too distant, Britain's African colonies may be self-sufficient medically. And it was not too long ago that few people would have believed that an African could rise to be director of medical services in Nigeria, and that young doctors from England would be coming out to work under his supervision in the remote plateau and jungles of this colony. Now, it was all very well to teach a small, elite group of colonial people to become doctors. But what education should you give the ordinary people? There are some white people and some countries uh, that believe that you shouldn't spread modern Western ideas among primitive subject peoples. They're convinced that it can only cause trouble. Things should be left as they are, simple. By and large, uh, British colonial administrations have never taken that attitude. Where they have found an appetite for learning and literacy, they have tried to teach. But how much interest and curiosity have primitive people shown with regard to Western ways? It can vary, of course, from place to place. It's the district officer and his wife come for a visit. They've brought an interesting machine. hard not to be curious about a marvel like this. But curiosity doesn't preclude suspicion. And suspicion can turn into hostility when the white man starts talking about the real reason for his visit to collect taxes. Public health, schools, and law and order all require money. Taxes and do without all this. Learning things can be made very pleasant, especially if the demonstration team has a traveling show and a natural comic in the cast. There's a right way and a wrong way to do everything. Our friend is a specialist in the wrong way. This man has a carefree, do-it-yourself spirit that can turn a garden into a desert. Actually, he much prefers the life of the open road. The travel broadens one, and you meet all sorts of interesting people.
now some instructions to read. Really quite simple. It's funny to the audience, but it's a very serious problem, illiteracy. In some colonies, large-scale campaigns against illiteracy have been organized by the British. And when the people have no written language of their own, a system of writing would be invented for them, suited to the tongue they had spoken for centuries. Teaching the ABCs may well have been the most far-reaching contribution Britain made to her colonies, for literacy opens new horizons, new and wider contacts. It might lead to a greater awareness of the outside world, stimulate a spirit of nationalism and aspirations for independence. We've been talking about the tradition of paternalism in colonies of what was once called the British Empire. Now they consider dependent territories within the Commonwealth of Nations. In these lands, paternalism was only one side of the coin. After all, the British didn't come simply to scatter blessings, for there were varied resources in these colonies, often without significance to the inhabitants, but invaluable to the white man. That meant plantations and factories and native workers, themselves one of the resources. The benevolent contacts between white man and native that we've just been seeing are one important side of the story. But there's another side to the story of colonialism, very important for the future, the economic one. And that's what we'll be talking about in our next program, which we've called Storm Clouds Over the Colonies. Until then, this is Edgar McInnes of the Canadian Institute of International Affairs.